Hey, this is Anthony Ha with TechCrunch. I'm here with Te Ken Levine from um, Irrational Games, where he's the creative director. He's also the creative director of Bioshock Infinite, which is about to come out. Yep. And um, so you actually created the original Bioshock game as well, but you sat out Bioshock 2. Um, what made you decide to come back with uh, Infinite, and what were sort of the, the goals that you had since you'd already you know, ha had such a great you know, success right. with the first one? Well, you know, Irrational, when we finished Bioshock 1, we sort of you scratch our heads and said, like, well, you know, what would we do with a Bioshock 2? And we really didn't know, like, because, you know, it seemed that we had told, for us, Irrational had told the story about Rapture, the city at the bottom of the ocean, that we wanted to tell. And we didn't really have a great idea. And it was, you know, I think there's some companies that might have said, like, okay, well, we'll just figure something out and do it because it's a sequel. And but that really, you know, fortunately, we were in a place where we could say, no, that's not what we want to do. And so then we sort of went off for a period of trying to figure out what we wanted to do. And eventually we sort of came up with the notion that Bioshock really wasn't necessarily just attached to Rapture, that it was a larger theme. So there's a larger context to the franchise. And we sort of had a lot of discussions about what that was. And um, we ended up sort of saying, well, what if we freed ourselves from that time period? What if we freed ourselves from that location? What if we just sort of took the themes of the game, the style of gameplay, and brought it to a totally new sort of setting and new characters and new story? And we decided to do that, but you know that we knew that would be an expensive, time-consuming proposition. And lo and behold, it was. <laughs> um, is there, do you think, uh, a risk in terms of like you know, you've got these fans who loved Bioshock, um, and you know that now you're sort of not giving them exactly what they want, um, and you're just putting kind of that there's a risk of people just saying, well, you're just kind of putting the Bioshock name on it. Yeah, when we, it's funny when we initially launched. Um, we had two reactions, with three reactions. One is, the one reaction was, cool, that looks great. Then there was another reaction, which was, um, this is just Bioshock reskinned with, in, with, with blue textures instead of like dark green textures like in the sky. Mm -hmm. And the other reaction was, wait a minute, um, you're, it's nothing to do with Bioshock. You're just calling it Bioshock because that was a successful franchise. And you know, one of the things that, and there's nothing you can say to that except, you know, Eventually, you give somebody the controller and you let them play the game, and that's you know what happened in December is we gave people the controller. And generally, the reaction we get, or I would say almost completely, the reaction we get is it feels very much like a Bioshock game, but it also feels completely different from Bioshock One, which is what we wanted. Um, we wanted people to have this sort of a thrilling experience of being in this new place, of being this character Booker DeWitt, of, of being in this time period of 1912, and. Um, having this companion, this woman Elizabeth, which you were very much alone in the first game, that you build this relationship with and go through this entire experience, um, but still feel like a Bioshock game, even though it has, you know, it seemingly has very little, um, very little clear connection to the original. Though gamers who played both sort of immediately sense something in the air that there is some connections of some kind. Which you're not going to talk which about. I'm absolutely not going <laughs> to. Okay, about. Um, so you know, I think that when people think about Bioshock and, you know, just in terms of the coverage, I mean, there's, when people start talking about the plot and the setting, I mean, there's, you kind of probably fill up for a full 10 minutes, and I would imagine, especially since you came up with most of it, it um, but I think, you know, when people think of Bioshock, it's, it's a lot of times it's really about the setting, so maybe that's one way you can sort of just talk about the concept of the game, is where, where, tell us a little bit more about the setting. So, it's, the setting is, you know, we looked at the, we looked at time periods that we were interested in, one time period that we, we found fascinating was the turn of the century, because it was, you know, Speaking as a, as a, as a, you know, in a tech crunch setting, <laughs> think of the technology that came around around about then. You know, pe people started having electricity in their homes. All of a sudden, there were cars, there were airplanes, there were movies, there were radios, there were, um, you know, list goes on and on and on. Phonograph records. There were there, there was everything. And where 20 years before, there were none of those things. There were telephones. There were, no, there were really none of those things. And you know, we've really only had one kind of piece of technology in our lifetime that's been that substantial, which is the internet. They had 10 internets, effectively, you know, in terms of things that just changed their world completely. And we just love that time period. We love what the, hit, the hit culture, the music, the clothes. And we really want to expand on that. And then, of course, we always want to then we take it to another level, which is it's a, it's a it's not a real city from back then. It's but the kind of city that people imagined they would live in back then. We saw a lot of art from that period that had these floating cities, these ide idyllic floating cities. So, you know, we looked at that kind of stuff and things like George Millet, you know, the, that filmmaker from the period. Mm -hmm, that, right. Um, uh, and um, we came up with this concept um, for this floating city that was run by um, a very sort of divisive figure named Comstock, who was a, sort of a religious prophet who led his people, you know, 
off what he calls the, the Sodom below, the, the, the earth below, which he thinks is not, is full of people who are missing the religious message, the proper religious message. And, um, you know, you and um, you and serve as running this city, and it's a, it's a very religious, a very nationalistic, a very racially divisive city, um, and you sort of end up in this place looking for this woman, Elizabeth. And so, you know, this, there is sort of, it's not necessarily a political game, but there's a, a political component, or, or people might certainly read it that way. That was also the case with, with Bioshock. Is that something that you sort of consciously set out to do, or is that just sort of kind of come up at some point? You're like, oh, let's just go for it. No, look, we, it's always about coming up with a story that's interesting. And um, I think utopian stories have always been interesting to me, or dystopian stories have always mm -hmm. been interesting to me. And, um, and you know, the effect of politics and culture and society on people's lives. And um, so, you know, we, start, we started playing with that, but we never sort of set out to say, let's make a game, like, let's hit these bases, you know. It's always about what's a good story, and if something fits the story, you know, we'll maybe lean more on it. If something doesn't fit the story, we may even take it out, you know. We don't, we, there's no preconceptions. Everything is, everything is up for grabs in terms of what we're working on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but do do you feel then? I guess going back to that question about like sort of risks and, and alienating fans, like is when when you when it starts to go into more political territory, is that something you kind of embrace, or you just are like, well, you, you have to. If you start getting scared of what you're, the story you're telling, mm -hmm. you, it's gonna show, you know. And you can't. You have to be kind of stupidly fearless, I think, to do this stuff because otherwise you're gonna end up saying, you know, you're gonna try to please people. And that's not what we're in the business of doing. I mean, which is weird because we're, <laughs> we're trying to please right. people from it. They're going to have an entertaining experience, but we're not. Right. We're not trying to, you know, we're not trying to sort of make people super comfortable with everything. We want to challenge people, and you know, we want to challenge ourselves too. So, to do either the the settings of Bioshock or Bioshock Infinite re represent your idea of utopia? No, I mean, I think it's clear from both games that you know, <laughs> the utopia, the, just the concept of utopia, is a complicated one. Um, I've always been interested in utopian thought, um, and you know, back from when I was a kid, you know, reading, you know, whether it was Logan's Run or or Brave New World or or Animal Farm, even you know, it's the utopian vision, which is you know, sort of like the one great book on politics that everybody should read. <laughs> the only book on politics you really ever need to read, um, or 1984, or, right, you know, right. Or stuff like that. Um, I've always been interested in that and always sort of been a bit of a, you know, I think my skepticism as a person comes across in these games and any right. sort of holistic system that answers all questions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit of a doubter. Right. Um, so on that subject, I mean, I think one, one thing that when I, when I told my friends that I was going to be interviewing you, everyone said, oh, you've got to ask them about the Peter Thiel thing, which is, again, this uh, sort of... <laughs> Project, which and, and I'm honestly not not an expert on it, but from what I understand, it's it's sort of an effort to actually build this sort of you know libertarian utopia on the sea. And yeah. I think certainly one of the jokes that I hear a lot is, oh, that's basically like Bioshock in real life. I was curious, you know, what what you thought about that. Well, you know, when we when we did Bioshock, sort of one of the goals was, you know, in in, in Atlas Shrugged, there's this notion called Galt Galt Gulch, which are going to build a society with just the right people in it, and they are going to. You know, Atlas being the character who was carrying the world around is going to just drop the world and say, you deal with your problems. I, 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 you can no longer look to me to carry you. And so they create this utopia in it. And what I was trying to do with Bioshock was to say, okay, well, that's the utopia where Ayn Rand, who made the philosophy, made all the rules and all the characters sort of were under her control. What if things weren't under everybody's control? And I think that's the problem with utopias. We bring ourselves to it, you know, and, and we bring all, we think we're leaving our problems behind, but we are, and I don't mean this in a cynical way, but we are the problem. Like whatever social problems that occur right. come out of us. It's not like they fall out of the sky. <laughs> and um, I think people think they're going to go to a utopian society and it's just, it's, I think it's not really possible. Right. That's probably fair. <laughs> Um, so one last thing I wanted to ask you was about, um, you know, so, you know, Bioshock Infinite is, is one of these sort of big kind of tentpole games with high production values. You guys spent years on it. Um, and certainly those are still coming out, still very popular, um, I think. But at the same time, there's, you know, I think a lot of excitement around sort of casual gaming, mm -hmm. mobile gaming, social gaming. Um, are those things that, that you're looking at or are you interested in those, those at all? And I play, you know, I play a fair amount of them. I, you know, I have an eye on my trip. I've got an iPad and an iPhone with me and I, you know, mm -hmm. play those, you know. Um, and I think that it's always about 
but I don't sort of like think about like, oh, what platform do I want to do? I think about you know, what experience is interesting to me and to the team. And then you sort of see like, well, where does that fit? Like, is that a, is that a mobile game? Is that a, is that a high-end console game? Like, what is that a PC game? What is that? Mm -hmm. And I, so I don't really know yet because I haven't thought about the next product really at all. Right. Um, so I, I, it's hard to say. I, I like those things. Um, it, it's unclear, you know, how I, what I would do on them. But um, I think that whatever I want to do, I want to make sure that it's something that embraces the platform it's on rather than fights the platform it's on. You know, that's always been the challenge of first-person shooters on, on, on. Right. So you're not trying to, like, squeeze this kind of exactly. console experience onto an iPad or something like yeah. that. Great. Well, thanks so much for your time. And Thank I'm looking you. forward to playing Bioshock Infinite. <laughs>